How do the airlines in this photo from 1984 connect to these airlines in a photo from 2021? We're going to tell you in this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. We're going to take you back to the dawn of the jet age when airports like uh, LAX seen in this futuristic rendering uh, gave a uh, promise of amazing air travel by jet airliners in the future. And in 20 years, we started seeing a trend uh, that was just unexpected, mergers in aviation. Were they really survival of the fittest? Let's find out. I had the occasion to work for a company that had been merged. Uh, my dream from the time I was a kid was to work for the Douglas Aircraft Company as an aviation artist. And that dream came true in 1977. Uh, but by that time, the company was called McDonnell Douglas. And it was two different worlds. Uh, it was an interesting experience. Would you buy a used jet from this man? Yeah, I got involved in a lot of corporate activities. And it was a great 10-year run. I really enjoyed it. But uh, there were times where it was like working for two, two different companies. For instance, here's my uh, company badge. Nice hair. And uh, you can see the two names uh, on the badge, the Douglas Aircraft Company at the top, McDonnell Douglas Corporation at the bottom. And depending on which department I was interacting with, uh, it could be a very different experience. It was kind of the classic us and them uh, mindset. But uh, the reason for that is that the McDonnell Corporation uh, built uh, incredible aircraft, uh, but they were military fighters for the Air Force, Navy, and Marines, like this legendary F-4 Phantom II. Uh, they were headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri. And Douglas was in Long Beach, California and they were building airliners by that time, the uh, DC-8 series. Uh, and the difference between a, a fixed price military contract or selling airliners was night and day. Um, the Douglas company had built a reputation based on very deep personal friendships. Uh, like here you see the uh, United President uh, Pat Patterson with Donald W. Douglas. But this was an era where airline presidents like Juan Tripp or C.R. Smith or Eddie Rickenbacker could literally order 20 jets over the phone. That was a very different way of doing business from uh, the military side. To get a better understanding, let's take a look at the Douglas logo. This is the very first logo from the 1920s. And the slogan, first around the world, uh, came from three airplanes that circumnavigated the globe for the very first time in 1924. And that's uh, represented by the three airplanes you see circling the earth in the logo. These were the Douglas World Cruisers. Uh, big, uh, rugged uh, biplanes, uh, five airplanes began, three uh, made it all the way around the world. One airplane was lost in a weather accident. The other uh, was lost at sea, uh, being towed by a Navy cruiser. Uh, miraculously, there was no loss of life. It was an amazing feat of uh, airmanship. Uh, the trip took six months, 62 stops. It was an amazing event, but it really put Douglas on the map. So this became their first logo, and those three airplanes were always symbolic. Uh, through the war years, World War II, uh, the logo eventually morphed into the space age. And there's those three airplanes again, now they're jets. Uh, and the orbit around the earth is a missile. So that uh, trip went from six months to 90 minutes in uh, about six decades. The McDonnell Douglas Corporation was formed in April of 1967. And now you can see the logo, the orbit is still there. Uh, the missile has a little delineation because they were now uh, dealing with spacecraft, uh, satellites, whether it was a warhead or whatever. And the three airplanes became one SST type airliner. Now, the reason I mention this is take a good look at the logo. You have the Earth, the orbit, and the airplane. And in 1997, that logo became this. Quite a connection to the 1924 flight of the world cruisers. So how many brand new aircraft designs were produced by the McDonnell Douglas Corporation at Long Beach in the 30 years from 1967 to 1997? Was it two, four, six airplanes, eight, maybe nine? What do you think? Brand new designs that went into production at Long Beach in the 30 years between 67 and 97. You ready? It's only two. 
The first was the DC-10, and technically this was a Douglas airplane. It started in 1966, but uh, credit where credit is due, it wouldn't have been built without the merger, so it is a McDonnell Douglas DC-10. The second airplane is the C-17, which was the very final airplane ever built in Long Beach and the final fixed-wing manned airplane ever built in the state of California, but that's another story. Uh, Trivia question, what does the C-17 and the DC-10 have in common? Both airplanes use the exact same windshield. All the rest of the airplanes built in those 30 years were derivatives. They were either the military version of a commercial airliner, like the C-9 that you see on the left, which was a DC-930 built for the Air Force, Navy, and Marines. And on the right, you have the KC-10 Extender, a uh, t aerial tanker version of the DC-1030. Uh, 60 were built and they're still in service today. All the rest of those airplanes that uh, were manufactured in Long Beach were derivatives of the DC-9 and the DC-10. The DC-9 Super 80 that you see at the lower left uh, was the uh, grandfather of a whole series of uh, advanced DC-9s, uh, the uh, MD-88, uh, the 87, the MD-90 uh, was the longest of the series and the MD-95 uh, was renamed the 717 after the Boeing merger and that was the final airliner uh, built in Long Beach. On the lower right, you see the MD-11, which was an extended fuselage uh, upgraded engine version of the DC-10. On the military side, uh, the uh, company had acquired two British designs. That upper left, you see the Harrier, which uh, that's an AV-8A in the photo that evolved into the AV-8B for the Marines. And at lower right, you've got the T-45, a Long Beach project uh, from the, the old A4 days. And that's the Navy trainer uh, that evolved from the BAE Hawk in uh, the United Kingdom. But let's take a look at commercial aviation. That's uh, what I'm gonna focus on for this program. And uh, uh, Douglas certainly was king of the hill in the 1950s. Here you see a, a DC-7 uh, first class lounge. And by the jet age, there was the promise of all this luxury, the <laughs> cathedral ceilings and eight foot wide aisles and, and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, it was a promise of a very special era in air travel, uh, which did happen in the early 1960s. But something else was going on. It was a very different industry back then. Uh, it was highly regulated. Uh, these were the four main carriers in the United States. Uh, at top, you have the two flag carriers, which served international routes from the east and west coasts. You had Pan American World Airways and Trans World Airways. TWA also flew domestically, as did United and American. But the point I want to make here is that uh, if you were going to a certain city, you were going to be on a certain airline. Uh, the regulations were very strict as far as airfare, the routes they flew. Uh, and so, for instance, if you were going to go to Denver or Chicago, you'd be on United. If you're going to Dallas, you'd be on American. Kansas City or St. Louis was TWA, uh, again, from either coast. Uh, and then you'd have the regional airlines, Eastern, Western, uh, Southern, North Central. And they would serve the uh, medium range uh, routes in those regions of the country. And in 1978, all of that changed. The Airline Deregulation Act under uh, the Carter administration uh, sought to increase competition and lower uh, airfares, and it certainly did that, but it also set up a kind of a free for all. And uh, a good visual would be the uh, comparison from the regulated era that you see here to deregulation, which was just chaos. Um, all different airlines were flying all different routes. Uh, there were fare wars all over the place. And at the end of uh, a decade of that, nearly 100 airlines had either gone bankrupt or been formed and gone bankrupt. Uh, it was just an amazing wrenching time uh, for anyone working in the industry. For instance, at Douglas, we had uh, a special, what we call the deregulation package deal. Uh, we would sell you a pre-owned low mileage uh, DC-9 flown only on Sundays by a little old lady. And uh, that would include a color scheme workup, a complete flight and cabin cruise, full maintenance package, full training program, but wait, there's more. We throw in your own bankruptcy lawyer. It was kind of a gag, but it made a point because that's what was going on about that time. Some airlines, even those with proud histories like Eastern, uh, simply went under and, and disappeared, uh, as did Braniff. And uh, I couldn't mention the end of Braniff without telling the story of the uh, 
uh, the Great Pumpkin, the big orange 747 that they flew from Dallas to Hawaii. Uh, when the airline uh, was officially closed down, they radioed all the airplanes in the air to land immediately at the closest airport. And at that moment, the Great Pumpkin was flying over LAX at 39,000 feet on its way to Honolulu. And the captain basically said, I have 350 people in the back who paid good hard earned money to go to Hawaii. They're going to Hawaii. What are they going to do? Fire me? Well, I thought the winner of the most merged airlines uh, making a carrier today was American. And they're close. Uh, they, they were uh, composed of many other companies, some of which you see here. Uh, PSA and Air Cal from the West Coast. Uh, U.S. Airways, which itself uh, came from Allegheny and Mohawk, uh, TWA, which it had acquired Ozark, uh, and uh, so a lot of different companies uh, leading up to uh, American. Uh, I recently flew on an American Airbus A321, and one of the trays in the galley was stamped U.S. Airways, so it just, just goes to show. But the winner is Delta, the most airlines uh, in its history. Uh, so let's take a look. Delta began as the uh, Huftalon Dusters, a crop dusting operation uh, in Louisiana in the 1920s and uh, evolved into a really first class passenger operation based in Atlanta, Georgia. Here we see the DC-4. Their first acquisition was Chicago and Southern. It's beautiful uh, 749 Connie. And in 1953, Delta acquired CNS. Uh, by the jet age, uh, they were looking to expand, and so they bought Northeast, which was a good match because that was an airline that primarily went from the New England cities to uh, Florida. And again, this beautiful Convair 880. But Northeast is best known for the Yellowbirds, and this is uh, DC-9 in that scheme. Uh, Delta acquired Northeast in 1972. If you're not familiar with the Yellowbirds, that was a series of uh, aircraft designed by the legendary uh, industrial designer Raymond Lowy. And it was a very popular scheme, fabulous service. Uh, I got to fly on the DC-9 and the 727, both very memorable flights. Wonderful folks, a really, really outstanding airline. And uh, as I said, that became Delta in 72. Delta acquired Hughes Air West in 1980. And that uh, gave them a lot of West Coast cities. That was further augmented by their acquisition of Western Airlines in 1987. And uh, this seemed ironic, but uh, the great Pan American World Airways was on its last legs in the late 1980s. Uh, the competition was just uh, giving them a, a, a real uh, solid run for their money. And uh, by that time, Pan Am was looking for a merger and lo and behold, Delta acquired Pan American in 1991. Final acquisition was Northwest. Uh, in 2010, Northwest became part of Delta. But there's more to the story. Let's go back to Pan Am. Uh, Pan Am itself had merged with National, which uh, was kind of the beginning of a lot of problems for that airline. Hughes Air West had been Air West before it was bought by Howard Hughes. And Air West was composed of Pacific Airlines, West Coast Airlines, and Bonanza. Northwest uh, had acquired Republic and Republic was composed of North Central and Southern. So you get a pretty good idea of the uh, uh, number of companies from all around the country that uh, were eventually merged to form Delta Airlines. Let's go back to that photo you saw at the very beginning. This is LAX in 1984. You can see the Hollywood sign off in the distance. And uh, the airlines that are represented are Continental, Western, uh, D Republic and PSA. And uh, in the uh, foreground at the left is Musair, uh, DC-9 Super 80. Musair was acquired by Southwest, became Transtar, and that lasted all of two years before they went under. So with the exception of Musair, all the airlines you see in this photo have become part of these airlines today, Delta, United, and American. So there you have it, a look back at the airline industry uh, before all the, the mergers. Uh, quite frankly, uh, as romantic as those times were, we've come very, very far in terms of technology, safety, reliability, navigation. Uh, the technology today is just incredible. Um, but what has suffered, uh, unfortunately, uh, and I can say this from experience as recently as last week, 
the service on board, uh, especially in the COVID era, to be fair, uh, air travel has become nothing more than the aerial co uh, the component of mass transit. So it's a different era, but we remember all emerged airlines very fondly and all the wonderful people who work for them. I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. As always, special thanks to the late Craig Cadera and John Proctor, my dear friend Jeff Thomas, and the good folks at the Museum of Flying. Until next time, take care.